Welcome to the Tuesday Night Talk. My name is Arissa and I actually work for the Science Center. And with the Science Center and um, the Alaska Sea Grant and Prince William Sound Audubon Society and the Forest Service, that is who brings you the Tuesday Night Talk. Um, next week we will be hearing, it's going to be Audubon Tuesday. We switched it up this month so that they can do the precursor to the Christmas count. So make sure you're here next week to learn all about owls and what we do for the Christmas count. Um, there is a sign-up sheet in the back if you could do me a favor and write your name down there. And if you put your email address, we'll add you to the list so you guys can get notified on what we're going to be talking about every Tuesday, which is awesome stuff. So this week, week we have Matt. He comes and his background is in biochemistry, fish, fish ecology, fisheries management. His previous work includes research on Lake Ontario and Lake Erie wetland fish habitat and Chinook salmon natural reproduction in Lake Ontario tributaries. Matt began working for the Native Village of EX Department of Environmental and Natural Resources in 2013 and he moved to Cordova with his wife, Nicole, in 2014. Matt currently works for the Native Village of EAX, D-E-N-R, as the Natural Resource Coordinator. He is the Principal Investigator of NBE's Copper River Chinook Salmon Monitoring Program, and his position is funded through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office Subsistence Management Partners for Fisheries Monitoring Program. And he's here tonight to talk about Chinook salmon monitoring on the Copper River. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction. <gasps> Jiggle the VGA. <laughs> there we there go. We go. So um, the presentation today is counting needles in a haystack. Um, I'm going to talk about the past, present, and future of the Copper River Chinook salmon monitoring. My name is Matt Pache, and I'm just going to give another plug. My position is funded through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Subsistence Management's Partners for Fisheries Monitoring Program. Um, so I gave a presentation last year getting into the nitty gritty of Native Village of EX Copper River Chinook, Mountain, Chinook Salmon Monitoring Program. That was about an hour and a half long presentation. Um, you can check that out on the Tuesday Night Lecture Series website. Um, there's a YouTube link there. Um, you guys can watch that on the NBE program. I wanted to give a different presentation tonight uh, because that is that was such a long presentation and that is available online. Um, but with that said, if anyone has any specific questions about Native Village of VX monitoring program, I'm happy to get into that and answer anything that you guys might have. Um, but basically, um, what I wanted to do with this is I spent the last five years um, pouring through the literature and the research on Copper River Chinook salmon. And um, there's a lot out there if you know where to look. My goal for this talk tonight is to introduce the audience to some of that work um, that's been happening since you know the last 10, 15 years. Um, a lot of the data that I'm going to be talking to tonight um, isn't necessarily Native Village of VX data or data that I'm um, intimately familiar with. Um, so if you have very detailed questions, I'll probably refer you to the actual publications that are in the journals. Um, but my goal was to provide an overview of what do we know about Copper River Chinook salmon, who's been collecting the data, who's going to keep collecting the data, um, kind of get everyone introduced to our knowledge base and identify some gaps of our knowledge um, that we need to know. At any point through this presentation, if you have a question, just ask. Um, I, I'm cool with being very informal about this. Um, fire questions, you know, raise a hand or, or just, just ask. And uh, I'll try to, try to get to it. So, um, all right. So, uh, Copper River. Run timing and species composition. This is a big part of Copper River Chinook salmon monitoring, and one of the reasons why it's so difficult on this river, um, in this system. Um, run starts early May. Um, the fish, the sockeye salmon and Chinook salmon will start staging at the mouth of the Copper River. Um, Breakup really dictates when these fish start scooting up the river. 
Um, early season conditions, we've seen a lot of variation in the last five years. Um, we've seen breakup, you know, go into very late May. Sometimes breakup is early May. Um, that really dictates when these fish are going to start pushing up the river. Um, that's something that as our, as the conditions that we're experiencing continue to change, um, what used to be a pretty, potentially a pretty consistent breakup, um, you're going to start seeing big variation in that. And that's going to, that's, we're seeing that in run timing in that early season entrance into the river for these fish. Um, we, uh, the Chinook Salmon Passage at Bear Canyon, uh, that continues through early July. Sockeye Passage continues uh, through August, past Miles Lake, uh, but it tapers off rapidly in late July. Um, however, a study that we did um, looking at, uh, a study that ADF and G did using our fish wheels looking at coho salmon and um, steelhead in the Copper River, uh, they were catching you know, thousands of sockeye salmon a day all the way through, through August. Our fish wheels up at uh, the Canyon Creek site, so just below Chitna. So there are definitely sockeye still entering um, the Copper River um, beyond when uh, the sonar stops counting. So, kind of the biggest issue here with Chinook salmon monitoring is the in, spe in river species composition. As you guys know, the majority of the fish coming back to the Copper River are sockeye salmon um, in any given year. So, five year averages. Um, have been decreasing. Um, 03, 07, we're about 4.28% Chinook salmon in river. Um, 08, 2008 to 2012, we're talking about 3.09% Chinook salmon, and 2013 to 2017, it's dropped down to about 2.48% Chinook salmon in river. Um, so we're seeing less and less Chinook in river um, over this 15 year period and that's reflected in the species composition. How it's, much is that due to the sockeye actually increasing in number? And this year, what was that percent? Absolutely. Much higher probably, right? Yeah, yeah, so, so absolutely. And, and that's why these are five-year trends, basically. Um, any, give, any one given year, it, it's tough to draw a conclusion from a single year. When you start grouping them in five years, but yes, you're absolutely right. But if you look at absolute yeah. numbers instead of percent, what, is, what do the numbers look like? Look at the actual count of Chinook salmon. So the actual count yeah. of Chinook salmon, um, Chinook salmon population is decreasing on the Copper River. Um, it has been for the last 15 years. Um, and there's been variation, like you said, in the sockeye salmon. That 13, um, you know, that 2013 was a huge year for sockeye on the Copper River. Um, there were some of the years right around that. So you're, you're absolutely right pointing that out. Um, but overall, 15 year average, we can lump those all together. About 3% three per, three of the in-river species abundance is Chinook salmon. So that means in order to get at this 3%, um, you've got to put in a heck of a lot of effort to figure out what that is. Um, there are lots of barriers on the Copper River, as you're all very aware of. Um, turbidity, it's one of the siltiest rivers in the world. Um, discharge increases by a magnitude of order from winter to summer. Um, I mean, we've seen increases just this past summer, 100,000 cubic feet per second in a 48 hour period. Um, so a very a highly dynamic system um, that impacts the ability to get in there and do certain types of monitoring projects. Um, mixed species, I touched on, I just touched on that in the last slide. In water hazards, um, one of the issues with the Miles Lake site in deploying any type of in river sampling equipment is that you have these giant icebergs that are being broken off of Miles Glacier um, floating down the river. So um, the presence of in-river ice and in-river de debris absolutely limits the ability to get at some of the data that we, we wish that we could get at. Um, there's also a high amount of stream bed movement. The majority of the Copper River um, has low, a low level of bank stabilization. And um, we see a lot of channel morphology changes. Um, there are very few areas in the Copper River where you have uh, large enough boulders or bedrock to keep a consistent channel confined in a certain area. There are areas on the Copper River, and that's where you are. That's where you end up seeing these monitoring projects happening, such as uh, the Miles Lake uh, Sonar Site, or the Bear Canyon Fish Wheel Site, or the Wood Canyon Fish Wheel Site. Um, these are channel constrictions that are fairly stable. 
but the majority of the river, um, you have a lot of change going on. So again, that limits the monitoring projects that you can do. And um, on top of all that, we've identified over 40 tributaries that Chinook salmon spawn in, in the Copper River watershed. That's a lot. So we can't just go to the Belkana River, count Chinook salmon, and say, hey, this represents um, in-river abundance. It just, just doesn't work like that. And obviously, it's impossible to put a weir across the main, the main stem and count fish. Um, you just can't do that on the copper. Um, so biologists resort to the best available sampling techniques to estimate abundance through sampling. We're not counting every single fish. We're sampling a portion of those fish to get an abundance estimate. Um, that's happens for sockeye and Chinook salmon on the Copper River. So um, I, I said I'm going to talk about the past, present, and future a little bit. Um, aerial index surveys is how they used to manage Chinook salmon on the Copper River. Um, 35 streams were flown, um, but only nine of those streams were flown consistently between 1966 and 2004. Um, 2005, they reduced the number of streams to four. Instead of nine, they're flying over four. And um, by an aerial index survey, you're basically uh, flying over the stream pretty low, as low as you can safely get, and um, look out the window and you're counting the number of salmon that you see. Um, because of that species composition in the Copper River, 97% of the fish you're gonna see are likely sockeye, 3% Chinook, um, but with practice and um, refining your techniques, you can get pretty good at uh, differentiating between the two species, even from the air and the plane. Um, so this was a management tool that was used for a long time. The main reason for the reduction in flights from nine to four is because there is no tributary management priority on the Copper River. Um, there's no tributary escapement goal in existence on the, on the Copper River. Um, the only escapement goal on the Copper River is for the entire system, and that's 24,000 or more Chinook salmon. So because of that, um, they basically reduced the number of flights. Um, there's insufficient data using this aerial index um, for system-wide management. And kind of one of the big key things that I'm going to get back to with actual data later on, but I'll mention it right now, is through radio telemetry studies, um, we basically found out that the majority of the Copper River Chinook salmon are not spawning in the clear water tributaries um, that they were flying over and counting Chinook salmon in. The majority of um, salmon in the Copper River are spawning in tributaries that are too turbid to see um, through air and index surveys. So that's kind of the main reason why these have been reduced and why you don't see as much of that happening now as it used to happen. Um, now, if you got into this, got it, got to the point in the level where you started having an escapement goal, let's say for St. Anne Creek, for Manker Creek, for some of these long-term aerial indexed clear water tributaries, um, then you would have some great data because you'd have an actual escapement goal for that clear water creek. You fly over that clear water creek and you get that data. That'd be fine. But in terms of using that aerial data, and figuring out what's going on in the entire system, it's just not good data for that. So one of the things we have is enumeration and tributaries. Um, there are three projects on the Copper River um, where they visually count fish that are passing by. Um, the Gulcana River counting towers, that's probably the main one that everyone is familiar with. Uh, this is located on the west fork of the Gulcana River. Uh, they produce an expanded estimate based off um, a, a small chunk of time where they actually um, count the amount of fish passing over. You can see down here um, those light colored bars that go across the stream bed. They have a tower on each end of those and when the salmon passes over it they ID the species and they tally it. So they do that for a certain amount of time and then they expand that um, to estimate how many fish passed by when they weren't looking in the river. And, um, and, and that's how they get an estimate on escapement for the west fork of the Gulcana River above the counting tower. Now, I said it that way because uh, in 2013 to 2016, ADF&G did a radio telemetry study on Gulcana River Chinook. And what they found is that uh, about 
it was, it was just about exactly 50% of spawning um, in the Galcano River watershed occurs above this tower, and 50% is occurring elsewhere. So it's either occurring below the counting tower, it's occurring in the main stem of the Galcano River, or it's occurring in the east branch of the Galcano River. Um, so even with the Galcano River itself, it's tough to draw conclusions about how the Galcano River stock is doing um, because you're only counting about half of the spawning population. Um, so there's also been an overall decline in estimated escapement above the counting site. Um, it's been as high as 6,300 Chinook salmon passing over. Um, the average annual count from 2002, which is when this project was founded, to 2017 is about 3,600 Chinook salmon going above uh, the counting tower. So you can use that radio telemetry data and extrapolate um, to, try to try to get at how many Chinook salmon are actually spawning in the so another project, uh, the other two projects are operated by the National Park Service. Um, there's a weir on Long Lake, and uh, there have been no Chinook salmon observed 2008, 2017 um, by the weir. Uh, so it's mainly there to inform sockeye salmon escapement in the lake for the Long Lake population. Um, it's a really cool project. Long Lake actually has a fairly unique sockeye stock, um, and they enter the river extremely late. And, um, it's, they've been documented as being the latest spawning sockeye salmon population in the state. And um, they've, they've recorded spawning um, through, through October, November, and into December. Um, if you go to the National Park Service website, there's actually a neat photo. Someone on cross-country skis standing on the ice, um, and there's a spring percolating up, and they have a photo of sockeye salmon actually spawning. Um, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty neat system. Um, unfortunately, funding for that project uh, ran out, and in 2018, um, it did, did not occur. Same with the Tanata Creek Weir. Um, Tanata Creek, this represents the furthest extreme end of the watershed. Um, we're, we're way up around uh, the Wrangles at that point, and um, very, very low amount of Chinook salmon getting up into there. Um, the 10-year average is 18 Chinook salmon um, that are crossing this weir. So, as you can see, the enumeration and tributaries, given these three projects, uh, which are the only three that are occurring, um, it represents between 6.2 and 16.7% of the system-wide Chinook salmon escapement. Now, when you have a big range like this, um, it's tough to use these as an indicator of overall abundance. So again, these aren't used by managers to inform system-wide abundance of Chinook salmon. Um, we have a lot of variation and the reason we think that's occurring is because there's so much variation in distribution between stocks from year to year. Um, and that's, that's supported by radio telemetry data. <coughs> grab some water. So um, another project is uh, Copper River Marketing Association, Sonar. It's run by the Prince William Sound uh, Science Center approximately 10 kilometers from the mouth of the river, and this is the lowest sonar on the Copper River. Um, wow, it's really grainy. But uh, we can see the clear Martin sonar camp down here, and then up, by the, up on the top of the screen there, you can see where the Miles Lake sonar site is. Um, in the 2018 report, it was reported that approximately one-tenth of the river channel um, at this area is actually insonified. Um, sonar counts are much lower here um, compared to the Miles Lake sonar site. Um, you can follow these counts in season um, by going to the Prince William Science Center's website and you can get an idea um, of how those numbers look. So far the data is looking like there's a two to three day lag time between this clear Martin sonar camp and the Miles Lake sonar site. Um, now, because the counts are so much lower at the site, it's, it's tough to use this for, for in-season management data. Um, a couple of the reasons that could be happening are because, I mean, the reason that's happening is because the majority of the fish are passing outside of the insonified area. So what that means is you don't have as much bank orientation at the site 
fish may be spread out across the entire channel width um, and with only one type of a channel in sonified, it's tough. You, you're not gonna see the same numbers that you're seeing up at the Miles Lake site. Um, also, um, even, th this is a tough photo because this shows high water. So when this data is really useful is early in the season when it's very low water. So you don't have as many channels early in the season as that are shown here, but there is still water flowing down the 27 mile side. There are still other channels for the salmon to migrate up. So that could be another reason why the numbers at the Clear Martin Sonar Camp aren't matching up with um, our, our fraction of the numbers that you see at the Miles Lake Sonar site. And you can see, uh, you can just see the, what the river looks like between the two sites in the photo. Um, however, it does provide uh, presence absence data, which is great because it's two to three days below the Miles Lake Sonar site. So it is providing data. And, um, in an area that otherwise we're not really sure what's going on uh, unless fishermen are out in the flats. So um, now I'm gonna get into some of the in-river abundance estimates. Um, these are the projects that are looking at the entire salmon population as a whole. Um, and the one you guys are probably most familiar with is Miles Lake Sonar. This is operated by ADF&G. It's the longest running sonar data set in the state really impressive. Um, they've had several successful transitions over the years in technology. Um, they've gone from Bendix to Ditson. When they converted over to Ditson, Native Village BF did independent analysis using marker capture methods to try to see um, if the marker capture method and the Ditson method produced the same abundance estimate, and they did. They were very similar. They were within each other's standard error. Um, so that was a pretty successful independent verification of the Ditson technology. Um, and recently, they switched over to ARIS, which is an even higher resolution sonar system um, that provides a heck of a lot more detail compared to the Ditson sonar. Um, I'm gonna get a bit into the ARIS stuff later on in the presentation. Um, but basically, this provides an estimate. Um, for 10 minutes of every hour, um, at Miles Lake, they count every single fish that's coming by. Um, and then that's expanded to estimate how many fish pass during the next 50 minutes, um, and then extrapolate that out to a daily passage. So it provides uh, a, a really good estimate on what's passing that uh, million dollar bridge area of the Copper River. Um, and they operate from ice out of the Miles Lake area. Um, they try to get as close to ice out as they possibly can um, through late July usually around July 27, 28, um, they're shutting down operations each year. So the other in-river um, abundance estimate is for Chinook salmon. This is to figure out that 3%, um, and a heck of a lot of work goes into finding out that 3%. Um, the Native Village BIAC um, started a two-sample market capture project back in 2003. Um, there was a two-year feasibility study ahead of this um, we were just trying to see if this works and if, if we can obtain the sample size we needed to get the accuracy and precision goals um, met. And the feasibility study was a success and Native Village VX has been doing this every year since 2003. Um, so the way that this works with the Miles Lake data, the Miles Lake, at Miles Lake they just count salmon. So um, they have an estimate every year of salmon passing. Because 97% of the salmon are sockeye, it's not a huge deal to just count every single fish as salmon and manage the sockeye salmon fishery based off that data. Um, but what's done at the end of the year, um, Native Village VIAC produces an estimate and that's subtracted from passage at Miles Lake and that's how they determine sockeye salmon in river abundance and that's how we determine Chinook salmon in river abundance. So, um, I'm gonna briefly get into the market capture project, and uh, if anyone wants details, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, but location is everything with this study. Um, we operate in this area, which is essentially a no man's land, total wilderness, um, no fisheries occurring um, between our market and the capture sites. And that's an important assumption that we have to meet uh, for our project. Um, so all the commercial fisheries and subsistence fisheries are occurring below um, the marking site in Bear Canyon, 
and all of the in-river fisheries are occurring above the recapture site um, in Wood Canyon. So what this lets us do is it lets us come up with an abundance estimate for this area where no harvest is occurring. So by, under, by knowing the level of harvest below our camp and the level of harvest above our camps, um, we can get at estimated total run size and estimated total escapement. The way that ADF&G uses this data is we come up with an in-river abundance estimate for the number of Chinook salmon passing through Baird Canyon. To get total run size, they take all of the harvest on the flats and they add that to our abundance estimate and that gives ADF&G an idea of total returning run size. So how many Chinook salmon came back to the Copper River system. Now, this is an estimate and it's, it's an okay way of getting at this, but as, you, as we found out through genetic studies, um, you just can't add the two together and say this is the total returning run size because um, in some years, a portion of the Copper River Chinook salmon catch are Chinook salmon that are going elsewhere. They're not destined for the Copper River. Um, so we can refine that total run size through genetic, genetics data, and um, that's one thing that's um, been explored by ADF and G. So for escapement, the way that they get at Chinook salmon escapement in the Copper River is uh, we, again, come up with our in-river abundance estimate, everything passing through Baird Canyon. And then they take the estimated sport harvest, the estimated personal use harvest, and the esti estimated um, subsistence harvest from in the river. They subtract that from our in-river abundance estimate, and that's how they estimate, estimate how many fish actually made it to the spawn grid. On the Copper River, there's a sustainable escapement goal of 24,000 or more Chinook salmon, and this is how they see if that was met um, at the end of each season. So there's been independent validation of these Copper River in river abundance estimate projects, and um, this shows an example of it here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in 2007 and 2008, Native Village VF conducted a market capture study using the same methods that we're using on Chinook salmon to get an estimate of sockeye salmon abundance. And the goal was to have, uh, ideally, if the sonar is counting the fish properly, then our numbers would be close, or at least with the standard of standard error factored in, they would be close. And for the two year period in 2007 and 2008, they were pretty close. And um, that was right after they switched to Ditson. So that was a pretty successful independent validation. You're never gonna get spot on. Um, these are just estimates, both the SOAR and the market capture program, but um, pretty decent numbers there. And again, um, in 2003 and 2004, um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game did a rate of telemetry study where they estimated um, Chinook salmon abundance and their numbers were within the same standard error as the numbers that Native Village of Yet produced with our market capture study. So it's good to have these independent validations occurring um, between agencies because um, that keeps everyone kind of in check and uh, it helps, helps get us, give us an idea of how accurate our data really is. So a couple really cool studies um, that a lot of people don't know about um, one of the reasons I want to talk about it here today are the rate of telemetry studies that ha have happened on the Copper River on Chinook salmon. Um, so basically, it involves putting an esophageal radio tag, um, radio tag about this long, down into the esophagus, um, into the anterior stomach of the Chinook salmon. And you have an antenna sticking out their mouth. Um, I'll show you that in a second. But there you can see the radio tag and the antenna. And um, you can track the fish migration upriver um, using either telemetry stations, so you can have just radio towers at various points um, of interest throughout the river. So for these studies, they had radio towers set up at the mouth of every one, uh, the majority of the major tributaries in the Copper River. Um, and you can also fly in a plane with your antennas, nice and low, just like they do in the aerial index surveys, and you can pick up um, these tags on the spawning grounds. So it provides some great information on run timing for individual tributaries, arrival timing for the spawning grounds, 
and system-wide distribution. So how many fish are going to which tributary? Uh, there was a study done by Evanson and Wutig in 2000. And um, here's the data. I'm actually going to scrunch down because I've got this all on my computer. I did not memorize it. But um, sample size was uh, 426 fish. Out of the 426 fish, um, this is for the Evanson and Wutig study, out of the 426 Chinook salmon that were tagged, 356 of those made it to the spawning grounds. Um, 35 tributary streams were identified as spawning areas. Not the, out of the nine aerial index streams that I was talking about earlier, the 80th and G used to use to manage um, the Chinook fisheries in the Copper River, 24.1% uh, of the total Chinook spawning population was located in those nine tributaries. Um, so 76% were located elsewhere. Um, the tributaries were ranked um, in order. The Clutina River had 24% of the Chinook population. The Tonsina had 22%. The Chitna River had 20%. The Galcana River had 12%. The Upper Copper River tributaries, um, which is basically everything above upriver of the Galcana, represented 10%. And the main stem Copper River um, above Wood Canyon they found uh, from Wood Canyon all the way up to the main stem, um, they actually found 10% of the fish located in those areas that they found were spawning. Um, and the Taslina River, 3% of the Chinook run was located in the Taslina. So ADFG revisited this study in 2002, 2003, and 2004. And um, this was conducted off of our fish wheel, the NVD fish wheel platform. So as we were sampling fish, um, ADFG was putting in radio tags. Um, all of their telemetry stations were still set up on the river from the previous study they had. So for a pretty low incremental cost, we were able to get this distribution data on Chinook salmon for another three years. Um, so uh, 1,257 Chinook were tagged. Um, of those, 910 made it all the way up to the spawning grounds, or estimated to make it to the spawning grounds. Um, in this study, 32 um, tributaries were discovered to have Chinook salmon in them. And um, out of the nine aerial index streams, um, it varied from year to year. Again, this was a three-year study. So 46% uh, of the Chinook salmon were located in the nine aerial index streams in 2002. 34% were located in those nine aerial index streams in 2003. And 35% of Chinook salmon were located in those aerial index streams in 2004. Um, overall, during that three-year study, the Chitna River had the highest percentage of Chinook salmon, 28% um, of the Chinook salmon returning to the Chitna River watershed. Um, Upper Copper River, which again is everything above the Galcana, um, according to this study, 23% of the Chinook salmon population went to the Upper Copper River system. 21% spawned in the Galcana River, 12% in the Tonsina, 11% in the Clutina, and 4% were located in the Tasman. So one of the things we're seeing here is a lot of variation between years and between studies. So that's, that's, that's another issue with trying to take abundance of a stock in a specific tributary and correlating that to the entire system because we're seeing such high variation between tributaries between years. When they were radio tagging, did they do that like over a month period of time? Or? So they started the radio tagging um, right after ice out. I, I, actually, I apologize. Um, I don't have that answer for you for the Edmondson and Wutig um, because that was that was done using dip nets um, in Wood Canyon, and um, off the top of my head, I don't know I don't know how long their season was. Um, I can I can send you that paper though, um, and that'll have it. But for the saber ride study, that, because that was done on our fish wheels, I'm more familiar with that data. Um, so we we started sampling as soon as the ice went out. Um, that varied each year, depending on that. Um, but it was done right alongside the market capture program, um, estimating the number of abundance. And it was done throughout the entire season um, until the Chinook run petered off in mid to late July. And uh, here you can see the uh, antenna on the fixed wing airplane. And up here on the left, you have a little piece of plastic. That's a PVC pipe that actually, you open up the Chinook's mouth, that goes down and then you put the tag in through that into the esophagus of the fish. So, um, really cool news that we just got yesterday 
is that um, we'll be revisiting radio telemetry on the Copper River in 2019 and 2020. Um, this is a joint project between Native Village of Eak and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish. Um, so, starting next year for two years, um, we'll be applying radio tags to Chinook salmon and revisiting distribution throughout the watershed. Um, so, and funding's um, through the Alaska Sustainable Salmon Fund. So, we'll, it, it's pretty cool because this is something that should be revisited um, every so often. Uh, ideally, it's gonna, it would be done every year. It's just not financially feasible um, because we are seeing so much variation in distribution throughout the watershed. It's not like one river is, it is where they're, they're not ranked one, two, three, four year after year after year. Those numbers are switching around. So, um, yeah, anyways, pretty cool news. And here is uh, a Chinook salmon with the radio tag hanging out, the antenna hanging out of the mouth. Excuse me, Matt. Yes. In your earlier talk um, about the fish wheel project, you made a big deal about how uninvasive the tags were you were using. Mm -hmm. To me, this looks super invasive. And yep. I just wonder, you know, you've made a point of saying how many of the tagged fish made it to the spawning grounds, mm -hmm. but um, are, are they getting any indication of, you know, how using invasive tags like this is going to affect the... Yeah, so um, they've got... Uh, this is a, a method, a technique that's been used in fisheries for basically ever since these tags were invented. And it's something that you can track really, really well um, because it, by placing your telemetry stations in specific areas, you can get at some of that data. So our fish dropping out before our, our fish dropping out below Bear Canyon, you could put a tagging station there and see how many fish are falling back but not coming back up. I see. Um, so ideally, you'd want to see a fish detected twice. Now, you, you would need a series of, of stations to detect direction. Um, but um, one of the things they did, and out of those numbers that I told you, um, a percentage of those fish were harvested in the in-river fisheries. So the person who's fisheries and things like that. So those numbers aren't quite as scary as as I was leading, as I, I didn't get into what that dropout was, but there's absolutely mortality associated with this. Um, but it, it is an invasive technique, and um, a lot of it comes down to tagging techniques. So if you put the soft, if you put the radio tag in too far, um, studies have found that mortality increases. Um, again, this is one of the reasons why our sample size isn't going to be every every Chinook salmon. I mean, we're probably going to be tagging 500 Chinook salmon a year, um, and we're capturing you know six to eight thousand Chinook salmon a year. Um, so it's a small percentage. We're not going to be doing it on every fish. Um, but you're right. There there is a small level of mortality associated with that. But we can get at where that mortality is occurring, whether or not it's harvest, or if it's radio tag failure, or if it's just so those are some things that we can get at. And the tags are getting pretty advanced. I'm not, I would have to check with ADF and G on the tags that we're gonna be using for this, but I mean, they're making them now with accelerometers and everything so you can actually see if that fish is still moving or if it's moving down the river even. Um, and, and the speed that it's, is it going at the speed of the current or is it scooting, you know, and actually swimming. So I'm not sure if we're using tags like that for this study, but there are ways to get at some of that. Matt, do these tags emit a unique identifier, or is it just a, a radio signal that you're able to see? So, okay. unique identifier. Um, every one of these tags is unique. Um, so, it's a pretty cool data set. We're going to be able to link up the moment it was tagged at Bear Canyon and link that up to the moment it was detected, um, either by a telemetry station or by a fixed wing survey. Um, so it really provides a great picture of migration time through the system, transit time, um, and every one of these fish has a unique ID. These tags are about $198 a piece. Um, so. So, so you know how many you put out there, mm -hmm. so how many do you end up seeing over the period of time that you're doing the project? 
Are you seeing large percentage of them return a signal? Yeah. Um, tag failure is pretty low. Um, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be doing that. Um, but there is tag failure that does occur. Um, and yeah, um, you're going to have some fish that just that you just don't you don't know what happened. Um, but overall, the data is pretty good. Um, the last previous two times they did this study, the numbers were fine to meet the study goal assumptions. So it wasn't an issue then. I don't anticipate it to be an issue in this upcoming study. I've heard stories. Uh, I'm not sure if it's department personnel, but maybe perhaps it was the planes that were flying doing the spot checks on them. But they'd be flying down the highway and they'd be getting pulses <laughs> driving down the highway. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, we've actually <laughs> uh, one thing that we tried is driving through Anchorage, ah. and we actually picked up some fish um, in Anchorage uh, during you know peak of the gin and dip well season. Um, so yeah, yeah, you absolutely can. <laughs> you pick them up at some weird places sometimes. Any idea how many are being caught and removed from the system that you don't know what happened to? Yeah. It's a tough thing to get at. Yeah, no. Yeah, you know, when you, you take 500 and then you can verify 350 to 375, even 400 yeah. in their nasal stream, and then you have a percentage you can't verify anything. Well, so what we can do, is we could put a tower, and one of the things we will be doing is putting a tower above, below the Chitna Dipnet fishery and above the Chitna Dipnet fishery. <laughs> so that's gonna give an idea of what entered but didn't make it out. Um, that's an important data point. Um, but I mean, they're also gonna be, they're gonna be harvested by fish wheels yeah. all the way up <laughs> to the upper copper of the watershed the whole way. Um, so yeah, we, don't, we won't necessarily know if a fish is harvested in a fish wheel and taken away and not reported or if a fish potentially died. Um, now, if you fly over and you have a fish not moving on the side of the Copper River, it probably died. Um, so I mean, you're going to be able to get a little bit of that. But yeah, there is there is definitely a lot that you won't know. I, I just want like even even that though, like a, a tower on either side of Wood Canyon. Wood Canyon presents a, a flow barrier, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so fish that aren't in good condition just tend to that's where their trip ends. Sure. And they expire somewhere around Haley Creek or start falling back. You know, it's not common, but that I'm just saying there, there'll be alternate explanations for fish that that enter Wood Canyon and, and don't come out the other end and get detected on the upriver side of it. And there's a way to catch the, those dropouts or count those dropouts. Well, ideally, if they're not, if they go any distance down the river, you'd make it to the next tower. So you you you're counted going into Wood Canyon. You're not kind of coming out, but you're counted downstream, and you've you've fallen back. Then we would know that fish is wasn't necessarily harvested and didn't make it. But in this complex system, we may not ever see those tower again. And we absolutely can't afford to fly over every single tributary in sure. the top of the watershed yeah. too. So there are going to be some fish that we're tracking up to a certain point. Um, on the river with our tracking stations, and then we get nothing on the spawning grounds right. um, because they went up a, a river that isn't being surveyed. The majority of the rivers will be surveyed in this, and um, through the previous two studies, we've got a really, really good methodology to kind of go off of, uh, which is great. We're getting better and better every time we do this. Um, but yeah, there are absolutely going to be fish that drop out that we just aren't sure, sure what happened. Um, so another really cool study that's happening right now um, on the Copper River is Code Water Tag Study. This is another study conducted by the ADFNG Division of Sportfish um, out of Fairbanks and Glen Allen. Um, and basically what they're doing is they're, they're putting a substantial amount of effort into tagging uh, PAR, juvenile PAR, um, in the fall. And also they're tagging smolt in the spring, out-migrating smolt. Um, they're capturing them, they're clipping the adipose fin off of these fish, and they're inserting this tiny little tag, you can see right there with the red arrow, um, into the snout of the Chinook salmon. Um, so printed on that tag, this is a really blown up version of it. Um, you can see the a number string, and that gives, um, that gives the fish a unique ID. They're doing it a couple different ways. They have unique IDs for tributaries, so if one of these fish returns as an adult, you figure out what tributary that was tagged in, um, and they're doing using different different code code system for the par and the smolt um, tagging too. So 
what this is is basically a mark recapture study that uses the same principle that we're using um, for in river abundance, but they're applying this to basically the whole life cycle of the Chinook salmon. This is really, really cool. Um, it's going to take a long time to get some of this data back because, as you know, Chinook are five to seven years old um, when they return. So this year, uh, 2018, marked the first year where we have a five-year-old fish returning um, with the coat of wire tags in them. Um, next year, we'll have five, six, and everything below. Um, and then the year after, we'll start getting some of that, those very, very rare seven-year-old fish um, returning, and that will represent our first tagging event. You know, So it takes time. And then after that, it's just going to build and build and build and build and build every year. So um, as you continue sampling, uh, once you get this, this first seven years over, um, then you're getting a cohort like every single season, so it's pretty cool. Um, but this is something that's going to have to happen for a long time before we really start seeing some super meaningful data out of it. Um, NBU is assisting ADF and G with the adult capture portion of the study. Um, that's because any given year, between 4,000 and 9,000 Chinook salmon are being sampled on our fish wheels. So we're a great sampling platform um, for the adult side of this. Um, and then ADFMG is doing the, the smolt sampling, and they're taking care of all of the tagging that's going on um, for these fish. You can tell that it's a coated wire tag fish by the adipose. Here's an adult on the right um, with its adipose fin clipped off there. Um, we might see like a little mound like that, but there's no, there's no big fin hanging off. Um, so that's how they're externally identifying these fish as a coated wire tag fish. Um, on the spawning grounds, you can walk around the lawn too and start picking up coated wire tag fish that way. Um, but uh, it, it, the, the adipose fin is the easiest way to identify a coated wire tag fish. This will complicate things. I know everyone in the Copper River is always like, watch out for those adipose clip fish because it might be a hatchery fish from somewhere else. Um, and that's not the case anymore because now all the coated wire tag fish in the system are going to have the adipose clip. So spread the word out now. How many tags you put out? So they're putting out, um, the stamp size started low and they're ramping them up. But I believe they're putting out, and this is off the top of my head, um, so I could, I'll, I'd refer you to the paper for the actual numbers, but I think they're putting out about 50,000 tags into PAR. I think they're putting another 70,000 out in SMOLT. Um, and I think those numbers are, are steadily increasing as they're refining their methodology for this. You have to put out a lot of these tags in order to get meaningful results when they come back as adults. So the survival, marine survival rate is just a few percent, right? So yes. you can guess how many adipose clip fish you're going to get, right? Yep. You so might get actually 100 of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. We might only be talking about 100 fish returning. Yep. Um, so, so, so this is something that you know you don't know unless you do it. Um, and as they start getting this returning adult data in, they can adjust their sample sizes um, to accommodate that. So, what is the plan? If you have an adipose clip, are you going to harvest that fish from the fish wheel that you get samples off of it? Then. Yep. So there's there's no way, un unfortunately, there's no way to read this tag without. So lethally sampling the fish. We call it sacrifice. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so all the coated wire tag fish are lethally sampled. Now, one of the recovery events is the commercial fishery, which is a great recovery event because all of those fish are already dead. Um, so that's a recovery event. A year like this year, they wouldn't have had much data if NV wasn't conducting mm -hmm. sampling uh, because there were, there were only 7,000 Chinook salmon harvested this year. So you want them to catch 10,000 fish next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Is there any communication, is there any communication with other programs that are doing these similar studies, like over on the Kenai River and down in Southeast? And are you communicating with those people at all? On, on, like, Kintang study. results coming? Yeah, yeah the um, Kenai studies have been going on for a long time, and mm -hmm. they've come up with some startling information.
bigger the fish, the more exclusive the spawn habitat, plus the rocks that were moved by those 50 and 60 pound fish, no other fish could deal with so that they were fairly selective in where they spawned. Not only that, they chased everything off that was too young to be there. This was all ongoing information they picked up while these long-term studies were being conducted. And it showed me, or told me there's a lot more of this than we've been spending money on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of communication, I'm not sure what's going on with interdepartmental ADFG communication or anything like that, but I'd certainly hope that they're all in the loop with each other on what's going on. And yeah. I think you're right. I think this, this is hopefully going to provide some really neat, interesting, novel data. Knowing what the users are harvesting upriver is really critical. In season, like the commercial fisheries all over the state are required and want, but in season, while other user groups and methods are ongoing, ADF and G doesn't get that information until October. And I had a neighbor that's just going ballistic to get it. Going. They don't get a number until October. You know, what, how do we know what happened? Coated wire tags uh, recovered from the commercial cock fish at the processor? Yes. And how are they? How are, aside from the adipose fin, is there any other way to know? Yep. So um, you, they have wands. Um, it, 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 the little wand that you just basically run over the fish. I mean, you could have. You can do it pretty quickly too, yeah. and oh. it'll be it can turn red if there's one of these tags um, inside the snout of the fish, um, so that it's a way to do it. So visual identification is pretty, pretty effective as well. Is this wand a complicated? No. Beep. Simple, <laughs> it's a simple device. It's, it's as simple as you can. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just, just, just hold it. Use it. And then you it your head. Yeah. It, it beeps or it doesn't beep. It, it, they're, they're pretty simple. I've used them, and I'm sure they've advanced since I've used them, but um, the ones I've used in the past uh, were, were really easy to use. Um, I think they're pretty expensive, though. I think you're talking 1500 bucks or more a piece. Most of the For the lawn. Because yeah. it has a fishery stamp on it. So um, we have some ex really exciting stuff coming our way in terms of technology um, that I, I really hope to see um, get incorporated into management of copper or Chinook salmon. Um, one of the most obvious things is sonar. Sonar has been advancing every year. It gets better and better and better. Um, the software is getting really, really good. Um, we're still not at the point where it can do automated counts and automated length measurements, but hopefully we'll get there. I think it'll be figured out. But um, a huge advancement that's been made is the resolution. Um, so the resolution has increased to the point where on the Kenai River, they're using this for management now. Um, they're measuring the length of the salmon that they're viewing on the sonar. Now, on the Kenai River, they have the entire river covered. It's, it, the, the whole river's in sonified. So, not only do they have sonars in the banks, but they have sonars out in the middle of the river. Um, so all the water is being looked at with the sonar. Um, and as the salmon pass through them, they basically have a team of technicians that sits there and looks and tries to figure out when the salmon image is pretty parallel to the sonar. So as you know, they, they flex like this as they're swimming. So if you get an image when the fish is flexing this way, it's gonna give you a different length from when the fish is flexing this way. So they have to pause it right when they think they're at that maximum length. Um, and there's a lot of finesse involved with that and a lot of work involved with that. Um, so that's why this is gonna be something that is gonna take some time to figure out, especially here on the Copper River. Um, but basically, when you get that fish to its perfect point, you pause the sonar video and you can uh, take your mouse, clip a spot on the on the, what you think is the snout of the fish, what you think is the tail of the fish. And in the Kenai River, they're finding they can get very, very accurate length measurements <coughs> of the fish using this technique. Um, so accurate that this is now the management tool for Chinook salmon 
for large Chinook salmon on the Kenai River. Um, so they have changed their escapement goal in the Kenai River to a large fish only escapement goal. Um, and basically, they base that off of, all right, where, where does the overlap of sockeye and Chinook end? And when do we start getting into lengths that we know 100% it's gonna be a Chinook salmon? And they have an escapement goal now just for those big fish, um, which is obviously much lower than what it would have been for all of the Chinook salmon. Um, and they're using this, I mean, this technique's been used. So the same types of sonars um, have been added to the Miles Lake project. Um, and they're looking into it, ADF and G's looking into it right now, and I highly recommend you guys go talk to, talk to the ADF and G guys if you want details on it, because I don't have the details on it. Um, but I do know a bit um, about the technology itself. And um, it, it, it's looking promising that eventually we can get to a point where we may be able to figure out how many large Chinook salmon are migrating past that Miles Lake sonar. And if we know that, now all of a sudden, instead of having a post-season market capture estimate, we'll also have an in-season passage estimate at the million dollar bridge area. So that would be huge for in-season um, management of the Copper River fishery. Um, it's gonna provide, it, it has the potential to provide a lot of, a lot of important data. Um, so, like I said in my first slide, um, Copper River is one of the siltiest rivers in the world. Um, silt and sediment absolutely impacts the quality of the sonar image. So this is probably one of the five toughest places in the world to do this on um, using this technology. So it, it's going to take some time to develop, but they're putting in the work now to get this done. And that's pretty cool because it could provide a really great data set for in-season management of Chinook salmon on the copper. Um, something that so, so along these same lines, NVE purchased, um, we have an Aris sonar as well. And um, we're gonna be using our sonar to look at um, some of the areas where potential bias could exist on our fish field sampling platform. Um, so we're using this tool to try to refine what we're doing out there. And um, a couple of things we're looking at is uh, composition, uh, based on length of fish that are passing between the bank and our fish wheel, outside of the fish wheel, and towards the center of the river, and then what we're actually catching in the fish wheel, we've got great length data set on because we're measuring them all. Um, so it's gonna give us an idea of what we're missing, and if there's a difference between what we're missing. Hopefully what we find out is that the fish in between the bank and the fish wheel and outside of the fish wheel have the same length, same length frequency as the fish that we're catching. That would be ideal. But we're looking so, into like for example, are you getting jacks in, in all areas, or are they, are they found just in one, in one side? Um, so, jack, I mean, we're getting jacks. In the fish wheel? In the fish wheel, yeah. And, um, and it's, it's one of those things, jacks are tough for us. Um, so, mm -hmm. jacks, we've seen, we've seen fully mature Chinook salmon in the Copper River that were like this big. Um, at, at some Those might be the so-called mini jacks you probably heard about. Yeah. Um, but they're fully mature. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, actually, I'm I don't want to bring one from, from the uh, mature. So yeah. the river that's about that size. Um, so I've seen them there too. Yeah. So about this big with developed gonads. It's spawn, trying to spawn basically. It's yeah. about the same length as the anal fin on a female. Yeah. So right, right next to the anal fin. So I want to spawn with you. <laughs> so so we know that these fish exist. Um, our fish wheels have escape panels on all of our live tanks. And that's something we have to have because as I pointed out earlier, 97% of the salmon migrating up the river are sockeye. So what our escape panels were actually uh, designed by Mr. Bill Weber back there. And um, what they do is they allow the sockeye salmon, the majority of the sockeye salmon to escape and it retains the majority of the Chinook salmon. But Little Chinook salmon, um, basically anything less than 500 millimeters total length, so fork to tail, um, we're not getting a, a, a good representation of anything below that size. They might be kind of hard to put the tag in too, right? It's it, small. It, I don't, I, we wouldn't tag. Okay. I mean, our tag. You're not tagging the, the jacks then? Anything below 500 millimeters, we're not tagging because 
they're not represented um, in our data set properly because they're, they escape. Any idea on the percentage? Um, off the top of my head, it's really, it's really low. I don't, I don't have an actual number to know. give you. <laughs> um, it, we, so those years that we did the sockeye salmon mark recapture studies, we had our escape panels closed. So um, I can get you the exact percentage during those years when we actually had the panels closed because we wanted to sample all the sockeye salmon. So if we had those panels open, we couldn't have produced a mark recapture estimate on sockeye. Um, so that data, that data's there off the top of my head. I, do you think you'll be able to catch any of those mini guns? You know, get to get back to get a full sample of it? Yeah, I mean, in terms of rotating through a wheel, yes. Yeah. But this it's is one of the cool if it has the, the wire tang in it to uh, get the data off. Yeah. So our, yeah. our, our baskets would catch it. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't, with the mesh size on our baskets, it would. However, and this is one of the things we can get at with our sonar is. Do these extremely small Chinook have a greater tendency of bank orientation? Are they all going to be located within three feet of the riverbank as they migrate up through Bear Canyon? And this is some of the info that the sonar is going to be able to let it. By the way, Sarkai also have jacks of different sizes. So they have zero check uh, jack, which is probably the really small ones. And it took like a century to find one in the Carlick Lake. There's a volume that came out a couple of years ago on Carlick. I mean, they're so rare. I had so many years I had to sample to find the first one. But they are also very small. So I'm just curious whether these mini jacks will turn out to be like, you know, zero checks. And also the jack coho that we have here, a lot of them are very small. So then my guess is they're, they're going out and doing a U-turn and coming right back. But if you need to prove it, you need to do it with geochemistry or with your tags. So that would just be a hypothesis. And one of the, this isn't, hard scientific data, this is totally anecdotal, and I'll just share it with it, share it with you because it's just neat information. Maybe it'll lead to a study down the road. But um, the only place we've ever seen these very small, I mean, um, small Chinook salmon um, that have developed gonads um, have been in the area bo immediately below Wood Canyon in the slack water. So it could be that the reason a high percentage of them are right there is because maybe maybe that presents a flow barrier for a fish below a certain size. No idea if that's true. I'm just shooting that off the top of my head. Yeah, I've seen one but spawning upstream in the Mississippi system. They, okay. can get, they can get up river. And of course, they're well known in Columbia now. That's yeah. where they do quite a bit. You need to run it, get, them in, get a sample of number in the lab and check their DNA and anything else if there's interest in that, in that fish. Yeah. It's kind of the, the, the whole thing. I think it's more just natural variation. Oh, so. But it, there's a tendency for a larger small to come back quicker. So it, ha it's, it happened in the hatchery when I was at the University of Washington. One year they got a ton of jacks because they overfed them in the hatcheries and they all came back as jacks. So you can you can create jacks just from the feeding conditions when they're in fresh water. So a couple other neat things that we're gonna be able to, that Native Village VX is gonna be able to do with this sonar is um, we have a really, really cool platform for getting length measurements using sonar and then actually comparing those length measurements with actual fish measurements um, of what we capture. So that's another one of the goals for us in, 2000, in this upcoming season is to orientate the sonar in a way that we can get accurate measurements on fish immediately before they're captured. Now, that's that right there is going to be tough to get to that point. It might be easy, you might point right at, but it also might take us a heck of a lot of time to get the position of the sonar right. I mean, these things are pretty finicky um, to where we can start getting that. But if we can figure this out, we will have a great tool for estimating length using sonar and comparing that with actual length of the fish that we captured. The other cool thing is that by you by backing that off, so so by taking these length measurements, by moving the sonar away from the fish wheel, um, we can get the accuracy of these lengths at different distances. Now, image quality on a sonar base, uh, exponentially drops off the further you get from the object. Um, and that's gonna be a huge challenge 
for Miles Lake to incorporate this type of data. Um, I don't know how many of you were at Shane's presentation at the end of the season, but it was amazing what a Chinook salmon looked like at five meters from the sonar and what it looked like at 11 meters from the sonar. I mean, that image quality just whoo, drops right off. So we have a platform we, where we can, we can start looking at the accuracy of those length measurements at different, dis different distances from the capture point. Um, so hopefully we can start getting at some of this data. Kenai folks have more money to buy more sonars, right? Well, the Kenai folks can put their sonars in the middle of the river. Um, because of the current there? Yeah, and that's just not an option at the Copper River site with the amount of ice. I mean, these sonars, you're talking 130, anywhere from 100 to $130,000 um, or more, depending on the rotators and everything that you have on them. So, I mean, one of these gets wiped out by an iceberg. It's just, it's not feasible. And, and unless someone can, I'm not saying there's not a way. There might be a way to build a protection system. Then you gotta make sure that doesn't interfere with the sonar system. You gotta make sure it withstands the icebergs that move the, I mean, as you guys saw, the icebreaker in front of the bridge this year totally rotated off. I mean, that's a lot of force coming down that river. So that's a challenge that we have on the Copper River that they don't have in the Kenai, because in the Kenai they can incentivize the whole area. So you might not need to get 50 meters out on the south bank. Basically on the south bank of the sonar site, they're incentivizing 30 meters out um, from the edge of the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And through studies they did, and that was informed by studies they did from a boat with the sonar, is they figured out how far fish were migrating. On the north shore, because when they repaired the million dollar bridge, they built this uh, pad that extended out. That changed the channel flow characteristics at the site. And they found that on the North Shore, the salmon are migrating up to 50 meters from the bank. So they have to get out 50 meters. Now, at, uh, at the Kenai, they can put a sonar every 10 meters. Because from 0 to 10 meters, you get great resolution on this stuff. Um, but to do that on the copper, it's going to be a lot tougher. Um, How are they anchoring that on the Kenai? I'm not sure. Matt, were you, did I hear you say with this AERIS software, there's ways to measure? Yes. So there's algorithms built into the software that you know, they take the sampling of three or four wiggles and take the average length. Yep. So, yep. So, so it estimate it figures out the distance that that object is from the sonar, and it can calculate. It, it can basically give you an accurate based off the algorithms of the distance and, and, the, and the bounce back and all of that. So being, a, being able to distinguish large salmon, I mean, we're there with the technology, but it needs to get a little better yet, you're saying? So we're there with the technology between zero and 10 meters, right now. But we need five times that, so we just need to make it. The dits on, on, on the Kenai River. Measure in pixels, they don't, they don't actually measure it in the sonar beam, it's not this, this sonar data. Okay. The old one could measure; it just was really rough and not, not good enough for everything. So, unfortunately, one of the one of the issues we have in the Copper River, um, it, I mean, it's it's one of the issues everywhere, um, or it, it's just it's something that they find. Chinook salmon tend to migrate further offshore than sockeye salmon, um, and that's supported by data that ADMG collected at the Miles Lake Sonar Site. Um, so, you have a higher percentage of sockeye near shore and a greater percentage of Chinook salmon offshore further offshore outside that first 10 meters. I don't know what percentage is within 10 meters, what percentage is out of 10 meters. That's all data that ADF and G technically should be able to get at with, with these studies. And I'm sure those are questions they're gonna be asking. Does the Aeris sonar need that substrate to run out on, like the older uh, sonars? So it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, it can detect, it doesn't need substrate on the bottom to detect an image. That's what you're asking, but, well, I, I just but they want an older sonar to use some run them out on a pad or oh, you a, mean that rail a rail yeah. system? Yeah, uh, so they haven't been using that. Okay. They haven't yes. used that in a few years now. Um, I mean, they, they place it near there. I think they put one foot of their H mount into that rail, um, and that's how they move it up and down based on the water level. Well, wouldn't it be worthy to deploy? You say you're taking a count for ten minutes out of the hour. Wouldn't it be a worthy attempt to uh, push a, another sonar further out into, into the river for 10 minute intervals to 
it's see really what's out there. Not practical in terms of how it works for the crew. Like it's apparently. I mean, I don't know that you, know, you, you should pitch that to ADF and G. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't can answer that question. <laughs> Throw a million dollars at it. But but yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of options well, here, and I'm I'm sure ADF and G is going to be looking into those. And, and I actually refer you guys to go talk to Stormy because um, <laughs> he will be able to tell you way more than I can tell you. Um, or Shane. Shane's also a great resource when he's here in the summer. Um, Shane Shepard, who's uh, been running the Miles Lake camp out there for the last few years. He's extremely knowledgeable. I would say among one of the most knowledgeable people in the state when it comes to sauna. So if anyone can get it done, it's that guy. Um, so another thing that NBE is looking into, and uh, we did a four-year feasibility study on the Gulf Canada River um, using this technology, is stream bed antenna arrays. So over there on the right, you can see this is one panel from the array, and you can put these panels all the way across the river. And um, these, so I'm going to pass these around. These are the RFID tags that we put into our SAMP um, that we use for um, our market capture program. We incorporated this into the program as a way to save time um, and reduce our sam the sampling time, the amount of time we're handling each one of our fish. Um, and it quickly, the, that little RFID chip quickly assigns a unique ID to each fish so we can then track that back in the data. You know, okay, we recaptured this fish at Canyon Creek on this date, when was it tagged? Or someone gave us a tag from the fish they harvested in the Gulf Canada River when was that tag in Bear Canyon? It gives us some really great data. But another thing that we can use this tag technology for is by putting a, a tenor array into the bottom of these stream beds. And when one of our tagged Chinook salmon swims over that tenor array, it detects that tag and logs it. And because each one of these fish has a unique identifier, every one of these tags is unique, it's a unique number, we can then tie that into a market capture data set and see how long it took that fish to get from Bear Canyon up to our tagging array. Um, and you can you can get even in more in depth with this the kind of stuff. And you can add a sonar and the tagging array, and you can start getting at percentage of tagged fish versus percentage of untagged fish. You can and, and you can even start extrapolating if you have enough of these arrays out throughout the watershed, you can start getting into distribution um, <coughs> based off of that, which is really, really cool info. Because um, this stuff, one of the biggest, or one of the coolest things about these arrays is they can be installed remotely in the wilderness. Um, you don't need to be at them all the time. You need to be there for an install, turn it on. Um, you should check it every once in a while. But the cost to run these things is extremely low, um, especially when you start pairing it. So we operate this under the propane, uh, propane generator. But you can pair them up with battery banks and solar panels. Um, and you can run these things throughout the salmon run with very, very little maintenance. So it's a cool way to get at some of that information. Where are they attached on the fish? Um, so we're, oh, that's my next slide, sorry. So we're attached, oh, that's actually kind of a bad one. <laughs> um, so we're, we're attaching just below the dorsal fin. Um, I guess I, sorry, I don't have them. Oh, no. Um, we're attaching just below the dorsal fin. And uh, I know I've got a great photo in here. Wasn't it kind of on? Right so right here, right where we're, right where that needle's about to go in, this is where we're attaching them. Um, so one of the parts, one of the things of our feasibility study was to determine if the read range of these antennas was strong enough to pick up a tag that was mounted to the dorsal portion of the fish. Um, so what we did is we put a tag up. So was, we installed this immediately above the Gulcana River. There's already a camp established there. Um, there's infrastructure there. Their boat's going up there to supply that camp. So it was an easy place for us to put this. Um, and the other cool thing is it was a, it's a clear water stream where a county tower exists. So theoretically, we could sit there and do the exact same thing that they do at the county tower and ID fish and see if a tagged fish is then recorded at the county tower or if a tagged fish is not recorded at the county tower. That was part of the feasibility study. And uh, we found that the, the reed range and the size of the river at this spot, we had 100% tag detection, which is awesome and almost impossible to get. 
Um, but it worked really, really well. Now, if you pop this into the Clutina River, where you have a much deeper area, there, there's the possibility that fish wouldn't be oriented with the bottom, and maybe they're higher up in the water column, and maybe you're not going to get that tag detection. Um, that's something that we, we don't know at this point. But um, so far, at least in the Galcana River, for this feasibility study, <coughs> it looks really, really promising um, as a tool for detecting our tagged fish in the tributaries. Um, so our, the next phase of this, because we've done it in a clear water stream, um, the next phase of this would be to put it into um, a glacial turbid stream. And um, we're looking at a couple rivers in the watershed to install the next antenna array in. Now, our antenna array was built by Biomark. It's their stout antenna. And um, they've gotten people have gotten pretty good at making these antennas themselves now, too. So um, but there are a lot of different options out there for these antennas. Um, and even people doing multiple antennas, one on the surface, one on the bottom. You know, when you have fish migrating through different portions of the water column. But um, they've made a lot of advancements in this technology um, since we did this initial feasibility study. So this is a potential path to get at distribution without having to invest in radio telemetry studies year after year. And that's something that NATO Village BX is looking into. Uh, just so you guys know, the thing sticking up, the, the antennas in that fiberglass structure that's floating on the surface, those things sticking up aren't antennas. That's uh, threaded rod attached to ductile anchor. You, you put that thing down the bottom, you use a jackhammer to drive those ductiles, and then we put bolts on and, and drive bolts in to, to bolt it to the substrate. Everybody kind of thinks the antennas are those things sticking up. Here. So you have to really drive those things into the bottom. You go all yes. the way down into the substrate. Yeah, <coughs> and the, after the first year of this, we had that enormous, you know, snowpocalypse, huge breakup on the Gulcana. It was a 100-year hundred, hundred flood on the Gulcana. Totally realigned the stream bed. There was a whole giant bend of the river that just was was a 20-foot a tall mountain of gravel, and the river just cut it off and, and went across it. And we had some damage, but this thing survived it and still functioned after it. Incredible. So we had, we had eight panels in, and one of them got ripped off. Um, the fiberglass on the top got damaged, and that's what got ripped off. The antenna was actually underneath the fiberglass, and that subsequently got ripped out probably by ice coming down during breakup. Um, but overall, the array survived that 100-year flood on the Galcana. Um, so that bodes well for at least being able to use this technology in rivers similar to the Galcana. Um, and the next phase will be to try it out in tougher environments. Um, and another thing, uh, you can put it, I mean, when you get into some of these really small tributaries, such as the, some of the spawning tributaries, you can actually run these antennas across the top of the water, too. Now, the state's never going to let you do that. Per, you're never really going to permit to do that in a navigable waterway. Um, but in some of these smaller tributaries that are non navigable, you might be able to get. Um, Except for the occasional slow trip, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. noticed on the, on the Chittenden Range, we were in the Tesco and McCarthy in the fall. We mentioned those fish below the lake. And some of the rivers they were going up to get to the lakes they were in spawning were, weren't really navigable and they weren't going to be any slow trips. And I was wondering if that may be the case with, since so many King Sam would go up the Chittenden River, if that's the case when we have our Chittenden River with King Sam. Yeah. That, uh, in the, in the Chittenden, that's one of those, it's one of those unique systems. Um, mm -hmm. we, I mean, I, I geek out when I look at this radio telemetry data, and you see the percentage of fish going up the Chittenden River. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, that's it's really such a wild and untouched watershed. I mean, you've got the road that goes to McCarthy there, um, but the majority of that watershed is Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Um, there's very minimal development, very minimal land use. Um, it's it represents kind of this big, huge, unknown area. Um, of the Copper River that's important to Copper River Chinook salmon. Some major tributaries on the south side of it, too, that you have to really fly into. Mm -hmm. yeah. One's a pretty major uh, uh, rainbow trout system, I believe. And it was. Know, there's a steelhead yeah, system. Yeah, steelhead, right. yeah. 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 And it's, it, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the cool things I'm going to be able to get to do with this radio telemetry study that we have funded for the next few years is fly over um, some of these spawning grounds in the Chittenden watershed. Yeah, yeah, so I'm really, really excited to start geeking out about that kind of thing. And uh, and, and, and yeah, 
again, it's, it's pretty amazing. Now this data that's here, they have, I mean, this is just big summary data for watershed stuff. I could do a whole presentation just looking at the details of this. I mean, you can, if anyone wants these papers, you can get them on the ADFNG website. Um, I've got them cited at the end of this presentation, but also just swing by the office and I'll print them out for you. Um, they're great studies and they get into the actual individual creeks that these fish, so it says shit in a watershed there, but then you can actually look up like, what creeks are these actually going to? And it's really, it's amazing the, the um, level of data that you can get from these radio telemetry studies. Uh, it'll be interesting to get the population size because yeah. you start getting a very small number of fish, then you end up losing some of the <coughs> processes that go into the selection. Mm -hmm. So the competition between the salmon helps drive up their size. And that's one of the problems with the salmon is they're getting smaller. I mean, Farmy mentioned that you can only spawn in certain areas, large ones that spawn in certain areas, but there's also the behavior that might get changed as your population gets smaller. So on the Copper River, we have, uh, that's a good point, on the Copper River, we're kind of experiencing, so, so Chinook salmon populations across the state um, have been declining, um, but one of the more unique things about the Copper is um, we have the Chinook salmon population decreasing. Um, we also have overall size of returning adults decreasing, and we're starting to see a decrease in age of, um, age of fish returning. So there's kind of a lot going on here on the copper um, that can't necessarily be said about every system in the state. Having said that, we've all heard mixed results about this year's run. You know, a lot of fishermen think, okay, the escapement should have been great because we basically weren't allowed to fish. We didn't catch very many of them. Um, and the general um, knowledge statewide is king salmon populations are down statewide. As far as I know, there's not been any information about this year's escapement, either from fish and game or from the uh, wheels, um, how did we do this year? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're, we're finalizing the data right now as we speak. I expect it to be completely finished in the next week and a half. Um, so I can give you a range right now tonight, but I can't give you the actual estimate because we're, we're, we just want to make sure of this before we release it. Um, but we're looking at between 40 and 50,000 Chinook salmon um, migrating past Bear Canyon in 2018. Um, this is a preliminary range. Please don't come screaming sure. at me if it ends up being 51,000 yeah. or 39,000. Well, how do you but, extrapolate um, that number? <laughs> so how do I think it's going to result? What, what I think escapement's going to be? Yeah. So again, this is preliminary, and I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for this. Um, but through communications that I've had with um, some of the managers, it's looking like the in-river harvest um, is going to be quite a bit higher this year than it has been um, compared to at least the five-year average. So the five-year average for in-river Chinook salmon harvest, that's the sport fish subsistence and personal use, it's about 4,300 Chinook salmon. Um, I think that they're looking at maybe three times that this year. Um, so potentially upwards of, of 10 to 15,000 um, Chinook harvested in-river. That's not finalized. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to be released. It, there's, I think their due dates for the person use reports was in October. Um, sport fish, they estimate through the mail out harvest survey. So there's still a lot, and, and I think the subsistence reports were also due in October. So there's a lot of that information that's still being looked at, but it's gonna be higher than it has been in the past. Um, so right now it's looking like we're still gonna end up meeting escapement, um, but I don't think it's gonna be the, the, the huge year of escapement. I'll know more about the inter abundance estimate, like I said, in the week, week and a half. But if anyone, feel free to come up and give me your email, and I can, I can email it to you when it comes out. I might be happy to share that with you. Um, but uh, yeah, in river harvest, I think it'll be probably another six to eight months before that's actually finalized and released. And, and will you be doing the fish wheel? Will this project continue, or? 
Yep. Okay. So that, um, that was another rumor was that the funding was drying up to where. Yeah. So uh, so and that, so just to update everyone, um, our long term funder for this project, I mean, going all the way back to two thousand one, has been the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Subsistence Management um, through their Fisheries Resource Monitoring Program. Um, it's a great program. It focuses on subsistence. It's all subsistence funding. So you have to have subsistence fisheries on the river for it to count. Um, but that's pretty much who's funded this project this whole time. Um, and that's a lot of money from 2001 up until 2017. Um, in 2018, they reduced their funding cap for grants um, in half. And that cut our project <coughs> Um, so while we were lucky and we competed well and we secured the grant for another four years, it only covers half of the Chinook Salmon Project. So we've been having to go out and find alternative sources of funding. Um, and that's a tough thing to do because a lot of times you're applying for a grant and saying, well, we hope to get the FRMP grant, which will cover half of it, so we're only going to ask you for another half, but there's no guarantee that that's going to come through. And if that doesn't come through, then I'm not sure what we're going to do. So it, it, it's kind of this chain reaction that really impacts the quality of your grant applications. Um, but we've been fortunate enough to, I'm actually going to pull this up. So, um, so we've been lucky enough to secure funding, um, some funding through Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, in 2018, they gave us $110,000 towards our project, um, which was huge, absolutely huge. And um, that counts as match. Um, we were able to obtain funding for the next three years of our study through the Alaska Sustainable Salmon Fund. Um, this comes with a match requirement. So we have so far met $110,000 of this match. We still have $136,000 to match before we're fully funded from now through 2021. Can anybody donate to that program? And anyone can donate to the program. It's got to be non-federal. Um, that's the that, so so that's that's the caveat. As long as it's not coming from a federal source, um, it can qualify as match. So that's that's one thing that we're working on. We're trying to secure the remaining 136,000. If we can secure that 136,000, then we're set through 2021. So that's what we're working on now, and uh, that's what we're trying to come up with. Um, but overall, we've we've accomplished quite a bit in getting a big chunk of this project. Because realistically, this is the only way we have to enumerate king salmon a Current, statement right now. Currently, yes. Real, real, yeah. real um, True. So our numbers coming. Our, our our funding is coming from. I just want to give this pitch real quick. Uh, U.S. Forest Service Chugach Ranger District. Um, they helped us out in 2017 and 2018. Um, Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish helped us out in 2018. Alaska Sustainable Salmon Fund is helping us out from now through 2020. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Fisheries Monitoring Program is funding half of our project all the way through 2021. So. Yeah, another question about the, the final escapement estimate. So when Fish and Game puts out that number at the end of the year, then they say this is how many kings have spawned. How much of all the information that you were talking about today do they use? Or do you know what, what actually goes into that number yep. and how accurate is it? So what goes, I'm going to actually, for the accuracy, I'm just going to pull up a chart because it's going to let me answer this way easier. Um, okay, so this is how that number is determined. Uh, and this is how it's been determined since 2003. Um, Column number four, the one in the middle, that's the in-river abundance estimate. This is all Chinook salmon. Column number four is the number that NBE comes up with every year. Column number five is our standard. <coughs> um, so this is how accurate we think column number four is. Um, that's our measure of standard error. Um, and that's found through statistics. Now, column number six, um, just to the right of the standard error, this represents in-river harvest. This is calculated by ADF&G and the National Park Service. Um, they calculate subsistence through people turning in permits. They calculate sport harvest through a mail out, a statewide mail out harvest survey. And they calculate personal use harvest again from people turning in permits. Um, so what Alaska Department of Fish and Game does is they take column number six, um, 
let's, for example, go to 2016, okay? Um, we estimated the in-river abundance through Bear Canyon at 16,009 Chinook salmon. That's the lowest in-river abundance we ever had. Um, that same year, the in-river harvest, so everything caught in river was 3,524. EDF&G just subtracts that from our abundance estimate to get their estimate of system-wide escape. So in 2016, it was 12,485. Now, we report an error with our in-river abundance estimate I, you would have to go and talk to Fish and Game about how an error is calculated on their harvest estimates, and if an error is calculated on their harvest estimates. In the reports, the, the end of season, like the Prince William Sound Fin Fish report that they put out every year, I haven't seen those numbers. I'm not exactly sure what it would entail, because what you have is you have different methods being used to calculate harvest. So the harvest, mail out harvest survey is very different than someone just turning in a permit, such as the person who is in the uh, subsistence fisheries. The person using subsistence fisheries are also estimated. They get a number of permits returned, but it's never the number of permits issued. So there is some estimation and extrapolation going on, um, or expansion going on um, with the estimated harvest, because not everyone's gonna return a permit every single year. Um, and I'm not sure how you add error associated with those with the error associated with the mail out harvest survey. Again, those are questions for, for Fish and Game. Um, but in terms of error associated with our project, we report that every year with our abundance estimate. So it was always my, I always thought it was the aerial survey that was a big indicator for the system wide spawning escapement. So are they not using that anymore? So they're, um, nope, they're not. So they haven't used that since. Um, 2003. Um, prior to 2003, what they were doing is, actually, I'm sorry, 1999, and I didn't report this, but 1999 to 2002, ADF&G did their own market capture study using uh, same method, similar methodology, but they were using dip nets to do what we do now with fish wheels. Um, so, so anything prior to 1999, what they were doing is they're flying over the tributaries, getting an assessment of the amount of Chinook salmon in the nine index streams. And then they were using commercial catch data to, I believe, ex conduct a catch age model to extrapolate abundance of Chinook salmon that way, or escapement of Chinook salmon. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that, that technique or the methodology. Um, Stormy or Jeremy would be two really good people to ask about that. Um, I, I think, or Steve Moffat, but. <laughs> He's retired now, so I don't know. But um, uh, Jeremy or Stormy could probably get at more of that information about what was done beforehand. But one of the issues that the radio telemetry studies have found is that um, we people originally thought that a lot higher percentage of Chinook salmon were spawning in those index streams than what actually are. Um, so there's there's certainly going to be some error associated with those earlier estimates of of escapement, um, but I, I don't know the details on that. I noticed that in your in your number four uh, estimations, the error on the last one is around 10% of the number, like 4,000 instead of 40,000. But if you go up that 12,000, that's way more than 10%, and then you got, you know, maybe a little bit, a little bit more than 10%. Then uh, when you're 30,000, you've got only about a 5%. How can you account, how do you account for some of that variability in the error? I mean, so I like guess more much more accurate in some years than others. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so so yeah, there's there's a lot that impacts that error, um, and it goes back to the first and second slide. Um, so we measure all of our effort on the fish wheel. So how what's the rotation of our fish wheel? throughout the whole season from the first moment we start sampling till the time when we pull our fish wheels. Um, so any kind of downtime impacts that. Um, so you there are some gaps then that makes your core cut Absolutely. I, I, well, I mean, that's one of the causes. That, that's not, that doesn't explain it all. But that's certainly one of the causes. Um, and it's, it's an easy one to pick out. Um, I mean, we wake up some mornings and there's a 60 foot tree um, across our fish wheel. Um, tons of damage and now that fish wheel is down. Now that's one of the reasons why we have two fish wheels at each camp um, on different banks. 
And so how do you how do you count the error? You just use that estimated daily uh, run and call that error. So so we have our catch per unit effort. Um, sorry. We have our catch per unit effort. Um, so that's one thing that gets factored into this. Um, and we also there are other there are other things that factor into it, such as how effective do we think our fish were sampling. Um, one thing that we've noticed on the Copper River is that when we have huge increases in a discharge, such as 100,000 <coughs> CFS in 48 hours, um, our catch rates drop way off. Um, and it, yeah, and there are a couple things that uh, 2018 was actually really, really neat because it was super, super, um, it, it was a really good data set that paired up really nicely with what was happening at Miles Lake. So on the Copper River this year, we had some we had two really, really extreme peaks in flow. Mm -hmm. And that Miles Lake counter went down to, uh, I mean, almost zero. Practically nothing was passing Miles Lake. And that correlated precisely with what we were seeing in our fish wheels. Salmon are smarter than you think. Yeah. <laughs> they won't yeah. fight the current. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's, there's a lot of little things that impact our error. Um, but also just the general population size, too. Um, in order for us to effectively sample a population of 60,000 Chinook salmon, the same way that we sample a population of 16,000 Chinook salmon, we would have to be tagging a ton of fish at that 60,000 abundance estimate versus that 16,000 fish abundance estimate. But the, so, the year with the 67,000, the error is actually less than 10%, so that can catch a lot of fish. Yeah. 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 It actually had a smaller percentage <coughs> than the error. So our, one of the reasons I don't report our I mean, it's, it's not that it's nothing I want to report, but people tend to draw the wrong conclusions from our catch. Um, is people will look at catch, or, or they'll, I mean, we publish our data daily online for anyone to view, and they can look at our catch rates of all of our fish wheels in season at public data, eac.fishscan.com, anyone can log in and keep track of it. Um, a lot of people will look at that catch and be like, oh, they had a huge day today, there must be a ton of fish in the river, or, or your catch this year was was insane, such as like that 2000, 2016, we, had, we actually had a really high level of catch, and that's why our standard error was very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a year where the river cooperated with us and we were able to effectively sample the entire season. That was actually one of the smallest runs, too. Yeah, yeah. So even though it was a small run, we caught a lot of fish in 2016. So if you're just looking at our catch data, our 2016 data, in terms of catch, looked identical to like our 2010-2011 data. Um, so, it, it, you, based off catch alone, you can't you can't figure out what's going on, um, and, and that's not how the market capture study works, anyway. So, so, they should. Yeah. so our catch varies a lot based on a lot of different things, and that all impacts our study. I mean, just for like water level, if you're saying high water does certain things, but we've we've seen low water cause the fish through the canyons to stop bank orienting. The, the flows can get so low that they'll just spread across the river and the fish will on we the banks. Yeah, so they'll go around it then. They're, they're, you're not catching them because they're going around we've, like, So we've gone up the river with boats with sonar and seen, seen marks that way and sort of when we weren't getting them. And it's just a lot of factors can influence your catch. And um, you know, in the past, w one of the things that we've improved that I thought Matt was gonna plug, but I'm gonna take a chance here. Um, in the past, we we the way we've counted our effort was when we get to a sampling session, we count the number of revolutions that the fish wheel makes in a minute, and then we we basically that's we know how many scoops it's taken in a minute, and we apply that back to the last time we counted. That's a very rough measurement of how many <coughs> scoops our wheel is taking, and our opportunities to catch fish being of you know. Every scoop is an opportunity to catch. You it. assume the same volume every time it scoops, kind of. It, it does because it's a floating, so it's always scooping the same amount of same volume of water. Um, and if you come in and, and you see a tree jammed in there, at some point between the two sampling sessions, a tree got in there and stopped. Well, before we would just say, okay, well we're going to assume it. The tree went in there the second we turned our back, and we count that whole section as downtime. So that's because you want to overestimate things like that. You don't want to undercut. You don't know how much you assume it's as bad as possible. Um, we've created these tachometers for our fish wheels and now we actually know exactly how many times it turned, whether it was turning backwards 
um, if it's sped up for a period of time and then slowed down for a period of time. So we're able to maybe, with the same catch and the same harvest and the same number of fish sampled, we can measure our downtime now so we don't assume it was this great period of time. We went, no, oh, it was only an hour, and then we apply it that way. And so that's a way we can sort of get a more accurate estimate with our catch data being exactly the same. Yeah, it's pretty great. We get uh, revolutions per minute, revolutions per hour, how many revolutions occurred between sample sessions. Um, and if there is downtime, we know the exact second that the downtime occurred now. Um, this was designed by um, our, one of our, our DDNR engineer. Um, costs about $120 per fish wheel for us to incorporate this technology. It uses the exact same RFID technology that we use in our fish tags. Um, every basket has its own RFID tag, and it, it records the unique number as it rotates around. If it starts rotating backwards, that's obviously downtime, and the fish wheel's spinning the wrong way because of an eddy or something. So we, we can refine that to a certain RPM, and now it's considered downtime. So we can be we're really, really precise with our CPU, you know, which is, which is pretty cool. About 120 bucks per fish wheel. <laughs> Going back to the uh, colored wire tagging, um, using those guns to insert the tags in the dorsal pin, is there any mortality rate from that? So, are you coded wire tagging or the tagging that the, the coded tag, wire the goes in the nose, thing. right? Well, are well, okay. you going dorsal with the coded So, the coded wire tags are put in the snout. And then okay, our, well, our, what's our, that other? Oh, the ra oh, that was a radio tag. Those are our, those are our TBA. Yeah, those, so those are, pit, we, we call them TBA. They're dual T bar pit tags. It's yeah, that yeah. yellow tag that passed around. Um, <clears throat> no, we don't think there's mortality associated with that tagging method um, it, it, it would be very tough to say that it was it was because of, if mortality did occur and we we have tracked that through the radio telemetry studies so how many of the fish that we radio tag made at the spawning grounds um, and things like that so we, we track the mortality but it's really tough to say did it happen because we put a tag in or did it happen because it came down the fish of a basket and hit its head or did it happen because it was bit by a seal on the way up a river. I mean, there's, it's tough for us to nail that so down. Sanitation protocols in your tagging equipment? Yep, so yep. Have, yep, so we, we, we put all of our tagging gear into a bath and between every single fish. That's just a requirement um, by, our, by the state and our uh, fish sampling permit. Um, yep, and it's going above the, it's going, so the areas that we want to avoid when we're tagging is obviously the spine. Um, based on Chinook salmon anatomy, we're well above that um, where we're tagging and the idea is to get behind so so the dorsal fin enters the back of the fish and we have a dorsal fin up here and then as soon as those rays enter the fish they're called pterygophores and we the idea is to put the tag through the pterygophores and it's, it's got a T on it so my finger here would have another T like that we go be, behind those and then twist and it locks in place um, those tags have been used um, yeah, for a long time, my fishery groups all over. There probably are actual studies that I can send your way that have looked into that specific tagging procedure and associated mortality. Um, yeah, I was just thinking of sanitation protocols in the sense that you might be introducing pathogens into the fish that may yep. have yep. made it unhealthy and not be able to make it to the end of the line. Yep, yep, that's that's a possibility. And I've seen a lot of tag fish and they didn't have fungi where the tag was, so. Usually uh, when the fish get wounded, they get fungus growing on them, and not even okay. that. Um, we, we, we developed those tags with the two anchors on them for the Chinook salmon in particular. The two? The, so the so two this, that particular style of tag with a single T-bar in it is a pretty common thing. Yep. Um, because these fish are so large and the system is so huge and so much water volume, um, we developed a double the double anchor system to, to secure them. So they're custom made for you guys. Well, yeah. I mean, they're available to anybody at this point. <coughs> you could just go buy them off the shelf. We, we developed them and now they're out there. It's you know. Pump print. Um, okay. in Australia. Thanks. Oh, that was one of the things. Imported. Yeah. Um, so our tags are uh, they're four dollars and eighty cents a tag. Yeah. Um, every tag. So we encourage people to return tags from the upper fisheries. 
Every tag that we get back to the office, um, we actually save $1.50 on our next tag. Um, we recycle those, we cut open that little plastic uh, piece of plastic, we get that little chip out, and then we send that back to Hall Print, and they'll put it in the next round of tags. Um, because all of our, we're not, it's not a multi-year study, so we don't need, it's okay for us to use numbers again the next year, because all of our fish that we tagged the previous year have died. Oh, there's the excluder panel that Mr. Weber made for us. So those are kind of triangle cam shaped things and by, by rotating those we change the, the distance between them and allowing fish of different size to get out of our tanks. Um, I'm happy to keep answering questions, but please don't feel like you guys you're going to be rude if you stand up yeah. and walk away. Um, do you caught any lamprey or seen any lamprey in any of the sampling? Yeah, we do catch lamprey. Yep. That's kind of a big question. Yeah. Thanks, Matt.